Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, while everyone is gathering and signing on, if you'd like to um, go over to the chat, uh, change the settings to panelists and all attendees and let us know um, who you are and where you're joining us from, and we will get started in just a couple of minutes. So Erica, whose work is behind you there? Which one? In your in your slot. Oh, sorry, we've already talked about your dog portrait. <laughs> Just oh, the dog. I got that. <laughs> but what in your slide there? Oh, oh, that is the work of um, Zina Sarawiwa. So okay. there's a piece called Table Manners that we showed at the Fowler um, back in, I mean, pre-pandemic land, I think it was 20, 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it's really fantastic. It was, um, it's two, two series of people from Ogoni land. This is, you know, her cultural heritage um, who are eating traditional foods. And it's just, you sit down and you join them for a full meal. And wow. it's all sort of, yeah. Yeah, local, local foods. It was, people had the best reactions because you have some people who are like, oh, I cannot watch anyone else eat. Like, no, thank you. And just would not go in the gallery. And other people who are like, can I bring my lunch in with me and join them? <laughs> That's great. It really ran the gamut. Fabulous. So, so it was from the before. From the before, feels like yes. It's really hard to reach back to and have any kind of familiarity. And, and to even remember years, like what date it was, it's like, that's all just yeah. a blur. Well, exactly, yeah. Yeah. 2019. No. But Zina's actually, she's moved to LA and she's doing some really interesting work right now um, with active cultures. And she's been doing these illicit gin institutes. So if people are in LA, I would look those up. They're really fun. She's, um, she's making her own illicit gin and it has this really interesting history in Nigeria and she's brewing them with local medicinal herbs and you do a tasting and she sort of talks about her background and these herbs and just all kinds of different things. And it's, um, it's generally kind of like a party. They're doing it at the Schindler house. Fun. So I think there are at least two or three more that are gonna happen. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. It's my favorite alcohol. I mean, that's not to like. <laughs> <laughs> gin, gin makes you want to sin. Yeah. To sin. Just speaking. Of she's tomorrow. making it with things that you've like never thought of before, like mango bark. Oh, you know. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And other, you know, I mean, lemongrass, but other sort of local herbs that we wouldn't have any really like frame of reference for living in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give everyone just another minute or two to sign on. Um, you please keep chatting. And then um, while everyone is gathering, you'll see in the chat, people are just saying hello and letting us know where they're signing in from. So if you've just joined us, um, please feel free to chime in there. Because I always think of juniper, right? I mean, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. I think, you know, um, I think you can do it with anything. Is sort of, you know, I think technically it doesn't Herbs. count as gin. It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't fall under our legal definition of gin, mm -hmm. but it is the same process just with different herbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our most famous girl at the National Gallery is, is called Ginevra, which is juniper in uh, Italian. Mm -hmm. Does she have some gin with her? Um, well, it's the it's uh, it's it's Leonardo da Vinci. Um, I'm not sure they were drinking gin then, oh. but it's our it's our Leonardo Ginevra da Vinci. She's got this big juniper bush, all spiky, coming up behind her head. So I always think about her. I think about gin. Hmm. All right. Well, if you're all ready, I think we can go ahead and get started. I am so thrilled to be welcoming everyone to what has sort of been called season two of Aiming High. We were so excited to get to bring it back. Um, my name is Megan Bernstein. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at Marlboro. And uh, again, just thrilled to be welcoming you all to this Aiming High uh, event. Before I introduce our guests, I just wanna have uh, just a couple Zoom tips. Um, 
time allowing, we will um, be able to take maybe some questions from the group. So if you do have questions, you should be able to find a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you'll put your questions there so we are sure to track them and see them, that would be great. And I will do my best to monitor the chat as well. But if you do have questions, um, that box will be uh, the best place to submit those. That is that is really it for the Zoom housekeeping today. So without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce our guests, uh, Connie, Erica, Mary, and Mika. Um, I want you to hear from them, so I'm going to sort of let them do their own introductions and, and tell you a bit more about themselves. And so I will just dive in with um, what you tell us a bit about yourselves and uh, your work and maybe how you decided um, on your particular field, both curation itself and um, the maybe the particular discipline that you are in as well. And uh, Connie, if you wanna start us off. Um, sure, thanks Megan. And it's so nice to be with uh, everyone today. Um, I was thinking this morning when I got up that I, I actually wasn't a very good student at Marlboro until I figured out uh, about art history, which I think was um, Lee Walcott's class in those years. He was the head of the upper school and um, taught a wonderful AP art history course. And then also there was an option as part of that course to go to do a kind of art history tour of Europe. And that for me was like, there was no looking back. I just um, loved the class. Uh, loved art history and, and realized I wasn't such a bad student after all. So when I got to college, I um, was a lit major for a while, then an art history major. Finally, um, I also was a um, choreographer and involved in dance. And that has always, I think, had a big part to do with um, my interest in kind of the creative process and um, really my focus on contemporary art and wanting to live, uh, work with living artists. Um, that was, ever since I figured out it was a thing that was possible to do, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so I kind of focused on that and, um, you know, can talk more about that, but that's, that's what I've been doing ever since is really a focus on contemporary art, um, working with living artists, uh, and in many ways kind of facilitating um, and providing a platform for artists within the contemporary context. Um, that said, I am really committed to museums and our field is going through a lot of change as are many um, institutions in the humanities, I would say, and maybe we can get into that a little bit, but I really believe in, in museums and the work that all of us are doing within them. Thank you, Connie. And would you just share where you are now and, and what you're doing? Oh yeah, I'm in a dark hotel room <laughs> uh, in Chicago because I'm I'm here with um, a member of our board who wanted to come to the Art Institute of Chicago to see a show by the artist Barbara Kruger, um, which was curated by an old dear friend of mine who's the associate director at the Art Institute. So we're here doing kind of an art tour for the weekend, um, which is, I guess, off the clock, but it's really a, you know, a privilege to be in another city looking at art. It's great. Thank you. Um, Erica, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess, you know, I was always at Marlboro, I was always sort of interested in, in like the anthropology history track. And then, you know, sort of like Connie, I took art history, except, uh, you know, my generation, we all had Lou Weniker. And so she was the one who for us was sort of, you know, like Lou B. Wen, you took that class and it was, it was a thing. Um, so, you know, taking that was that moment I was like, oh, okay, this is perfect. Like, art, anthropology, where does that meet? And, um, and I got really lucky that, you know, that senior year between high school and college, I had an internship at the Fowler Museum where I work now, you know, sort of like it came full circle um, with a Marlboro mom, Betsy Quick. Um, her daughters, Megan and Kate Neville, were sort of, they were on either side of me in terms of um, age group. But yeah, I worked with Betsy and the first day she sat me down with this NEH grant because she was like, I have no idea what to do with you because you know nothing about museum work and you know nothing about art history and like, what am I going to do with you? And she said, like, read this. And it was this show that they were doing called The Saint in the City. And it was about the, the Senegalese saint whose image is all over Dakar. And I was sort of like, and it was that moment of sort of like Connie had of like, oh, you can do this. Like, this is a thing that you can do with your life. Like, sign me up like yeah I want to do this 
Um, so yeah, so after, after college, I just made the mistake of going straight into the PhD, which I recommend to no one because like go and live your life a little bit. But um, after that, you know, I sort of like serendipitously ended up working at the Fowler Museum and I'm their curator of African arts now. And it's just sort of like, I, I couldn't ask for a more exciting collection to work with. But yeah, that was sort of my background path to, uh, to where I am now. Thank you. Mary, will you go next? Sure, thank you. And thanks, Megan, for um, having me. I'm honored to be with these illustrious art historical or art historian colleagues. And in fact, we were talking, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't know that many from, from Marlboro days who got into this crazy field that we're in. Um, so I actually came into art history as a historian and uh, I uh, fell in Barnum's ninth grade European history class. And I think it has to do with, and actually majored in history as an undergrad. Um, and I think it has to do in part with living, growing up in LA, which is so sort of anti-history and, you know, so present and future oriented so that history and specifically Europe uh, is just so exotic. Anything old is very exotic to me. Um, so I majored in history and then uh, worked uh, actually at Barnstall Art Park and decided I wanted to try art history in graduate school. And within the first month, I was completely hooked getting a master's and kept going uh, after working a little bit, uh, a little while. Um, and I started in Houston at the Museum of Fine Arts there. I was seven years there. It's a very, very much of a civic art museum, very connected to its community, very much part of the city, the leaders of the city are all on the board. It just was fantastic to sort of apply art history to something that people were paying attention to. Then I went to the Getty for five years, which is pretty much the exact opposite. Great place, not you know intensely connected to the city of Los Angeles or the state of California or the um, nation, uh, sort of um, wonderful place, huge privilege to work there. Uh, and I think missing uh, that connection, I, I moved to the National Gallery where I am very much a, a public servant uh, uh, federal employee, and we, we talk about it every day. And I've been there for, over, for just over a decade. Um, but obviously a gigantic honor to be at, at the National Gallery. Um, so that's, that's me. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Mika. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Megan, for organizing this. Um, so my uh, background is, my, I grew up um, with a mother who was an artist and came from Japan, 1967, and um, was very involved with the downtown um, uh, Little Tokyo um, scene and was friends with uh, Sam Francis, who is an artist, um, had a studio uh, near in, near in on West Channel Road and we used to go there all the time. Um, his wife was Japanese. And so I kind of grew up with contemporary art um, and artists and uh, around, but my father was a very different, he was a businessman and he died when I was eight. And so my mother just quickly took over um, uh, the business and very much discouraged me from going into the arts because she knew world, especially the art artists, you know, it's kind of one in a million, um, according to her, to really make it. And um, so uh, she had always wanted me to go the diplomat route. So I um, had at Marlboro, I also took AP art history. And I was, you know, secretly always wanted to um, study art and do something in the arts, but I ended up at Berkeley majoring in um, political science and international relations, uh, did a year abroad in Japan and just ended up like going to all the museums, loving, um, wanting to learn and, uh, and realizing that there was this lack of, um, in art history, the study of, of contemporary Asian art. So I decided that I would kind of combine my, I, was, I mean, I was very passionate about um, contemporary politics as well. So I did a double major in, um, in poli sign and um, art history, and then ended up writing on this artist, contemporary uh, Japanese artist named Yuki Noriyanagi, who actually I organized a show this year. So it's kind of come full circle at, um, uh, in, at a gallery in LA. But um, while I was an undergrad, I, I did the Getty Multicultural Internship Program at LACMA. 
um, and I organized a contemporary Japanese print show in the Japanese pavilion. And then I got into um, the year long internship pro program at MoMA. And that was after I graduated from college. And that was probably the, um, my, a life changing experience in terms of understanding what it takes to really, you know, organize a major exhibition. I mean, I was in a small department. Um, it was film and video, but um, under working under a curator named Barbara London. Um, but I, I immediately knew that I wanted to um, be a curator and uh, pursue the a very specific route, which was you know um, introduce Japanese art to the U.S. and um, so I told my mother, I'm a you know, I'll be a cultural diplomat in a way, you know, instead of a political um, diplomat. And um, so I ended up um, going to graduate school at UCLA. And then while I was at UCLA, I actually worked um, at MOCA where I met Connie um, and uh, uh, interned there, or sorry, worked for um, a major retrospective of Takashi Murakami where I learned how to you know, organize a major retrospective and then um, and then I worked for Alexander Monroe at Guggen the Guggenheim also worked on a major um, retrospective there and then I ended up at the Hirshhorn Museum for seven years um, in DC and um, so that's and then I, I left at in 2018 and now I'm an independent curator. That's kind of my life in a nutshell. Great, thank you. Um, Connie, I realize in your intro, we didn't get where you are currently working in the institution um, where you are now. Yeah, sorry, I realized that too. I'm the chief curator at the Hammer Museum. Uh, and prior to that, I've, I've been at the Hammer about eight years. And prior to that, I was at MoMA as the chief curator of drawings, MoMA in New York. Um, and then prior to that, I was at MOCA in Los Angeles where I met Mika um, and I was there for about a decade. Great, thank you. So I think what, um, what I have learned about the curation field is that there is so much time, years that can go into planning a show that the public then gets to see, or certainly that is my understanding at larger institutions. And you all represent such a unique, uh, or, or sorry, such a range of um, sort of fields and time periods and locations and artists. And so I'm wondering if you could each share sort of the, the process of bringing an exhibition to life um, from maybe your initial idea to securing the objects, to deciding on exhibition design, to the day that the public kind of gets to take it in for the first time. Um, and I realize that's a, that's a big question. So tackle that um, however, you'd like, but maybe Erica, do you want to start us off for this one? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the Fowler, we're sort of, you know, I would say we are like every institution understaffed. So there is a lot of, um, we're, we're sort of small, we have to be a little nimble. So I'll say that that process changes from show to show. Like I've definitely pulled something together in three months, which was um, not ideal, but, uh, but, one, you know, as an example of a process for something that we're working on right now, one of my um, one of my coworkers has a has a big grant, and a part of this grant was they were going to propose some shows, and they said, you know, does anyone have any ideas? And I sort of, you know, like as the as the good Marlboro girl, like raised my hand, was like, oh, you've asked for an idea, I'd be happy to share an idea. Um, you know, like what about pan Yoruba religions and sort of like Yoruba religions in Africa and in the diaspora, and what does that look like? Because that is. You see it in Brazil and in, in Haiti, really all over this sort of one, one part that is radiated out. And so they're like, great, we're gonna do it. We're gonna have, so we have, we're focusing on our own collection and we have a two year process where we're working with um, an advisory group that's basically a group of practitioners for this, this whole range of religions. Some, you know, some are Yoruba, some are Nigerian, some are coming at it from the diaspora. Some are, are local, you know, African American practitioners, and and it's we're trying to figure out a way to integrate, um, you know, our curation. So we go through the the collection. We have meetings with them. Hear what are the most important topics coming out of of their relationships with the objects. Um, create a framework around that, and then the the gallery text will be this sort of. Um, 
I, I don't know what it's gonna look like yet, but this collaborative process where everyone's voices are, are coming through in different ways. And we're sort of hoping to get a little conflict in that too, because we have different perspectives on the same object. So we're trying to, you know, get get some some different some some hot takes on on everything basically um and and so right now we're we're sort of crafting those those various organizations and then we're also bringing in um a contemporary artist to do um a commissioned work to go in in connection with all of this to sort of um fight against something that we're constantly thinking about when we organize exhibitions which is this um sort of historicizing of African arts that occurs where people seem to think of this as only existing in the past. And yet we're trying to sort of show that these are all still continuously vibrant. These are still used objects in, in large portions of, of Africa. So that was sort of a wishy-washy version of an answer to your question. It's not like a set, pro I would say it's different every time because you know when it comes to, I, I think this is for, for everyone in every part of the field and curation, it's you know with every artist, with every idea, it's gonna be different. For me, it's like, you know, we're working on an entire continent through all of time. So every process is gonna be sort of, it feels like we're, we're rewriting it every single exhibition. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Mika, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, so as Erica said, I think it's, it really varies depending on the type of show you're organizing. Um, when I was at the museum, and at the Hirschhorn, I mean, we did a lot of collection shows. And so um, that was also, that was very mind opening in terms of researching, getting, having an opportunity to really look at the history of the collection and the acquisition histories. And then, you know, I'm um, trying to develop a new uh, refreshing, uh, a new perspective to um, narrate those kinds of histories um, within the contemporary, you know, dialogues of contemporary art. Um, I've also, you know, organized solo exhibitions, major retrospectives. Um, the NARA show that's up right now at, the LAC at LACMA that has 700 works. Um, and the artist and I went through and I mean, most of the um, pieces are from his collection, but there were a hundred from um, various collect lenders, collectors that um, we had to contact um, through so many different you know, avenues, through galleries, through auction houses, through, um, through you know, uh, private foundations. So um, the, there's the, his, you know, the research component and then there's the logistics component, which takes up a lot of time. Uh, and then there's of course the publication. Um, I'm working with a museum right now in Hong Kong. And yeah, I mean, that they, are, they have, Of a, um, a contract with us and, and so you have so many different um, um, voices I guess to um, you know uh, evolved in terms of how to produce um, the catalog that goes with the exhibition as well with the designers um, and then of course contributors and um, so yeah I mean the the I guess the, the early part the research part is, is exciting but then there's just this the, you know, rest of it, which is very much a, collaborat a collaborative process. Um, and then of course the installation, which is my favorite part, um, is uh, you work with the staff of you know, the museum to um, execute your vision. And it's really um, physically, I think, um, and mentally, you know, challenge um, to lay out the spaces. Um, and so my, my dissertation was on, a, on an artist group um, that really the negative space, like the, the part that you don't use, that was very um, uh, present. So I always think about the breath that is needed around you know, the work and how, that, how the work itself is in dialogue with you know, um, how you create certain narratives um, between artworks, between galleries and how you tell that story. So, I mean, I know I've, all of you experienced this, but Thank you. Uh, Mary, do you want to go next? Oh, sure. Yeah. So all of my artists are long dead. And I know from hanging out with my modern and contemporary friends that that is, that is significantly easier to work with um, people uh, who are gone. Um, and, uh, and so, 
you know, every show that I do is intended to sort of advance the field, field of knowledge. Uh, so sort of advanced art history. And, um, and so just sort of methodically, and, and it absolutely varies case to case, but you, you know, come up with a story that you want to tell, you create a checklist that will tell that story. Hopefully you have a colleague in another museum or two that you get to work with because museum work versus to some degree academic art history is really about collaboration. That's the thrill, that's the kind of juice. Um, and so working with other, with staff and other museums is really exciting. It takes, uh, I would say two to five years um, to sort of get this thing rolling. Then you have to get the loans, which requires really going to see the object in person in every case and getting an appointment with the, the keeper of that object, usually a curator. And you've got to get in that office in real time in person in order to facilitate that loan. Um, I get a lot of cold requests at the, at the National Gallery and, um, and I'm, you know, you try and be kind, uh, particularly now, obviously, but, but if it really is important, you kind of show up uh, and then you have to write the book and at the National Gallery, they want that text, uh, gosh, to, to a year and a half in advance of the opening date. Hard and our European colleagues are not at all on that same schedule. So that usually causes some tension. Um, but then you write, write, write the story based on your research, which is super exciting. But I have to agree with Mika that the great event, of course, is when the crates show up and you start, it's like Christmas, you start opening these things up and, and, and arranging them. And I, I think, Megan, we might get to this, but I do want to say that what Mika, the way Mika so beautifully talked about how thoughtful she is about the gallery space I think it really underlines, and I, we've all really discovered this during the pandemic, you can do a lot of things digitally, but you know, art exhibitions are A, social, but they're also sort of spatial. And it's about the dialogue of the things on the wall. And I loved the way Mika talked about negative space in, a, in an exhibition, in a gallery. I love that thought and where you want your visitors to sort of take a breath and pause before moving to the next curatorial idea. It's a performance in a way that, is, uh, that involves the visitor. It's not just like curator and object, it's um, you know, educators, interpreters, but also you know, what the visitor is doing. Um, but uh, they're super addictive exhibitions and I've had to slow down a little bit because we're um, advancing other departments at the gallery right now and it's, it's hard. I mean, I'm used to, you know, just getting on that crazy wheel of, of ex doing exhibitions and I'm, I'm having to do other things now, which is good, but, uh, but it's, re it's really, it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. And Connie, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what everyone has said about installation and, and Mika's show at, at LACMA, the NARA show is so beautifully installed. There's really a, um, some people have it and some people don't know how to do it. And, and Mika really does. I think it's, it's really well done. Um, it's such a strange thing that we do here, you know, sitting, hearing you all talk. It's so, I'm always struck by that. It's such a weird, interesting combination of things. And I do think the collaboration is really important. I agree with what Erica said about um, exhibitions um, emanating from different places at different times. I really feel that, um, especially maybe in the contemporary arena. Um, you know, and I could use an example of a show that I just opened last weekend, um, which is called Witch Hunt, uh, and it's just top of mind, so I'll talk about it. I mean, in terms of the installation, I think one thing that's also true is once you think a thing into space in your museum um, and in the galleries, it becomes something different than what you imagine. There's, there's always something that I learn once I see the art in time and space and also see the different art and artists speaking to one another in space that um, this show in particular, I, I think is kind of a very weird show and you have to engage with it really deeply and it looks different than I thought it was gonna look. Um, in any case, where it, where it began, just to give you an example, um, is really out of a political impulse. Um, I was collaborating with my colleague, Ann Elgood, who's now at the ICA LA, which is where the other half of our show is. Um, and in the wake of the 2016 election, we really found ourselves thinking about the question of what does feminism mean in the age of a leader like our former president, you know, who is a serial misogynist and so on. Um, like what happens to feminism? Like, 
all of you know all of our activism, all of our uh, discourse. So we had been tracking a generation of artists from the late 1990s and early 2000s who we thought were reinventing the legacies of 70s feminist art um, in new ways. And so we decided that that was kind of the moment beginning in around 2017 um, to bring those artists together. Uh, it's an international show, so it kind of makes a case broadly speaking for um, looking at different political past and present histories through a feminist lens. <clears throat> but women working in different cultural contexts. So it's really broad. It's basically a big umbrella to pull together a lot of incredible mid-career women who are my generation of artists. Um, it's a broad umbrella, but the original impulse was actually to think about an exhibition almost as an act of resistance. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily believe that art can make political change, but I do think with our exhibitions, we all have the opportunity at different moments to speak to different political and cultural urgencies if we want to. And so this show is a case of that, I guess. I hope you'll all see it. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. Mary, you alluded to this a bit, so maybe you can answer this next question first. And Connie, I think, uh, talk about a cultural moment that we've all just come, th not even come through. We're sort of still in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm curious if, how each of you thinks the pandemic has impacted how people interact with or don't interact with art and how moving things digitally um, has, has impacted either your work or certainly the public's um, consumption of art. Are you asking me, Megan? Yeah, why don't you can start. Okay. Well, just because I basically <laughs> said my piece, but I, I do feel a real hunger for uh, on the part of uh, of a lot of people that love love art and love art museums to be to be with real objects, it's just they step into the gallery and like they're actually making noises. They're sort of like gasping and and it's just like ah, you know, back with the actual object. You you just you cannot have the kind of intellectual, emotional, but also visual engagement with art objects dig digitally, unless it's a digital art object. And then the social aspect, I think, is really powerful, and people aren't always aware of the fact that, um, you know, if you're engaging, uh, hopefully, with somebody you know, but it could be somebody you don't know, as you talk and look, things start to open up and change in what you actually see, and, you know, I think I think it's made us more aware of of, of that aspect. Thank you. Any anyone else? I don't want to call on someone if you. Have, if someone else has a thought. I would yeah. just, oh, oh sorry. Well, I was just gonna say that the, yeah, I mean, I think pandemic has definitely changed, affected, you know, this condition that we have been experiencing, this shared, you know, isolation. And um, the this urge and desire to go out and see art in person, um, it was kind of overwhelming to see, I mean, just in my, um, I had the chance to organize a show at a botanical garden and um, it was kind of insane how many people wanted to come out and loved the show. And only because I think because we're in this, you know, pandemic and um, there was such a, um, just a hunger, you know, and also just uh, psychologically wanting to have more connection you know, to, and art is the way to do that, so. I feel like this, you know, the, as the pandemic has really shaped so many museums, it, the, the George Floyd protests are really what have shaped our, our experience of the pandemic and sort of the changing museum landscape, you know, a general sort of crisis and what is a museum that is going on right now. So for us, it's really, um, you know, we've, we have in, you know, coming and reopening, we have seen the same sort of experience of people coming back to our galleries, but we've really spent, um, spent this time thinking about how we're going to change the visitor experience in our galleries during the pandemic. And we've sort of taken this closure to, to, um, you know, rethink how we present essentially what is a colonial, partially a colonial collection and what that means. Um, and so we've really been um, you know, 
I guess trying to bring the visitor into new conversations now that they're returning to us in a way that's been um, very, I mean, it's, it's challenging and some of the most inspiring work that I think that for most of us that we've done in our careers at the Fowler. Um, but I think that that for, for me, and that's sort of, you know, like the, the, the 10 second answer to that really big, big question. But, um, but yeah, that's sort of the, the crisis that, that we're experiencing. Thank you. And Connie, did you have something to say from earlier? Um, not so much, but just to build on what Erica said, I, it is, I mean, that's the biggest takeaway for me. I mean, yes, it's, it's of course true that we all want to be with art again, and I think you do see it in our audiences, but there is a real moment of redefinition that's happening and an opportunity, I think. And in the, in the best moments, I think it's a really hopeful moment, actually, if we can really um, get at the systemic um, issues that face our museum, whether they're you know, issues of exclusion and racism, um, just that are systemically built into certain collections and collecting patterns and patterns of philanthropy and everything. Um, and if we can really rethink some of those things, I think it's a huge opportunity. We're trying to, just in the exhibition program, um, go forward with some exhibitions that are organized in different and maybe slightly unconventional ways as a way of addressing the context of the museum itself and, and trying to rethink it a bit. Um, but it's a, it's a moment of great opportunity. It's really, really, really tough, um, but it's hopeful. Megan, I might just have to jump in here for a second um, because I have already, I already uh, announced that all my guys and girls are dead. I mean, being a Europeanist right now, you can imagine, I mean, you guys are all hip. Um, and mo modern and contemporary and um, non-Western, but trying to sort of like account for the core of the National Gallery collection, which is the basically European pre-1900. Pre we have very fine modern and contemporary, but I think we're best known for our historic collections, is really interesting and exciting. So we've spent a lot of time interrogating, reevaluating the Western tradition. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating because um, you know, Euro European art is, is right now considered not only to be irrelevant largely to contemporary discourse, but the you know, visual art expression of the oppressor, right? So we've, I mean, we've just got tons of work to do. So it's super stimulating to um, come up with the uh, sort of um, you know, learn new narratives about the collections that we have and speak very clearly about the crimes committed and speak very clearly if we can about the values that are worth maintaining. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating moment. I mean, I think, you know, we're discovering that Europe is not, you know, this monolithic thing that people thought it was. So we need to talk about that, um, you know, and then just, you know, deal with the fact that you know, well, and anyways, I could, I mean, I literally, I could, I could blather on for hours on this, but the point is, I think, as everybody's recognizing is that it's a really, it's a crisis, but it's, it's a really constructive crisis and very stimulating and very exciting and crucial. I mean, if we don't get it together, you know, certainly at the gallery, yeah, then, you know, we will be, we will be left behind or we, we will be co-opted by others. Speak on behalf of <laughs> Thanks, Mary. So I think um, you touched on this even in speaking about sort of this um, almost the crisis point or, or yeah, crisis point for museums, but all of you spoke a lot about the, the research that your work requires. And so I'd be curious to hear maybe either through this sort of redefining what a museum means or even just in the span of, of putting together exhibitions, are, could you share maybe a, a surprising or, or the most exciting thing you've come across in, in your research uh, throughout the course of your work? I'm happy to call on someone, but you're all looking very thoughtful so I can let, let you self-identify.
I, I was just telling someone very recently about an experience that I had. I, th I think the research is one of the great privileges of what we do, and it often involves travel. Um, and I'm really aware that it's a, it's a huge privilege. Um, I organized a show a few years ago at MoMA uh, with another colleague um, of the work of Ligia Clark, who's probably the most important Brazilian artist um, in the post-war period, let's say, late 20th century. Um, and I went to Brazil many times to meet with her estate. She is a dead artist. Uh, and the estates of dead artists are not necessarily any easier than the artists themselves, I must say. But um, in the process of organizing that show, one of the things that she did is eventually move away from object making into the practice of a kind of social therapy that she did through objects. We would think of it as art therapy, but she was making objects that were then applied to the body and so on. So in the process of organizing that, I got to visit someone who still practices her therapies, um, essentially in a very old kind of sanatorium um, in Rio. And it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had in my life. I sort of lied down on this little cot after finding my way, what felt like through the jungle, um, and had these therapies applied to me, these objects applied to my body, to sort of understand what it was that she was doing in late 1968, you know, under the um, dictatorship in Brazil, this work that she started to make, um, and then to sort of rediscover that in about 2012 or so was extraordinary. I mean, those are the kinds of things where you're you're sort of living art history and making art history. Um, and it's just, it's just an amazing uh, privilege, really. Um, I think for me, it's been sort of, we've been doing a lot of collections research that we haven't had the time to do um, previously. And, and one of the things that we're finding about our historical collection at the Fowler that's been really fascinating is just how much, um, just how much of it was sort of made for an international market. Um, so I think there is a sense of when you're looking at historical collections of African art that you have this storeroom full of previously used ritual objects. And what we are finding is this really interesting engagement between African artists and the international European American art markets of the early 20th century that I think a lot of people, we didn't expect to see it on this scale and most people don't expect to see it at all. And so we've been just finding, you know, a lot of really interesting examples where it's, I mean, the one that I, that I come to that the research I was doing recently was on um, a throne from Cameroon that the only piece of information we have about its history, its provenance is um, that supposedly it was looted from a palace in 1908. And in reality, this is a throne that was made explicitly for the international market. It was made to sell to German colonial like traders and, and you know military personnel. Like this was not something that was locally used. Um, and so we're seeing these examples of, of objects being recast as looted once they reach Europe as a way of increasing their value. So it's sort of like what we would see as pieces of incredible, interesting African innovations of forms that was not interesting at the time, that was not authentic at the time. And so, so now they have to become looted as if that is something that you're gonna valorize in you know, 1908 uh, London. And so, um, so we're finding these really interesting stories just about, about the economy. It's like, I never even took an economics class and now I have to get a crash course in, in sort of like the economies of the art market in the early 20th century. So it's, uh, that's been the, the really interesting research that, that we've been doing right now. Thank you. Um, Mary or Mika, you don't, it's not required that everyone answers every question. So we can also <laughs> go on to That's another. Cool. All right, Mika, I'll, t I'll, I'll, t I'll take this, take this bullet for us, but you can, you can jump in after me. I mean, it's just, I, every project I do involves discoveries, all, all the, all, all my research projects. So the thing I'm working on right now is uh, actually an extension of something I did in 2015. And it, it is about the art market for advanced French painting in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, which really was um, sort of monopolized by one guy. And he was called Durand-Ruel, Paul Durand-Ruel. 
And it turns out that he formed this thing called Impressionism that he sold mostly to Americans that was formed not just according to what he thought would sell, although that was a major consideration, but it turns out he was quite socially and politically conservative. And so the Impressionism that he sold to America is, is escapes by Monet and Renoir and lovely pictures of, of, of gorgeous women in beautiful dresses by Renoir and um, still lifes and flower still lifes and Mary Cassatt painting mothers and babies. And these are the things that uh, uh, um, were in line with a um, monarchist, uh, activist ca ca on behalf of the Catholic Church, father of five. Um, actually his wife uh, passed away when she was having her fifth child. They all went to um, Jesuit schools. Um, I mean, just super, super conservative. And so it leaves out people like um, this guy I worked on in 2015, Gustav Kaibot, who had a lot of edge and tooth to his work. Um, and then it also, what I'm working on right now, it leaves out a whole section of Mary Cassatt's oeuvre. I mean, she was the raddest girl going. I mean, this, this unmarried, um, uh, super ambitious American uh, in Paris. I mean, she was just sort of, um, you know, everything you want in, in someone who's gonna um, totally apply herself to advanced forms of art making. And she was also very socially and, and politically um, critical and made paintings and pastels and prints from that uh, point of view. But those don't, did not make it into the thing that Durar well molded uh, and sold. So uh, I'd love to do a Mary Cassatt show for 2026, but we'll, I'm having trouble finding a taker. But anyways, so this, that was like, yeah. And so I'm trying to, I'm publishing on this. I talked to, I published an essay recently on, on the Kaibot Durarwell thing. And on um, the end of the month, I'll give a paper on uh, Mary Cassatt and how her career was affected by this guy. Great guy. I mean, he enabled, you know, Monet and Renoir and, and Pizarro and Sicily. He enabled their livelihood but it's not as um, clean as, as I think we once thought it was. Nothing ever is, right? All these simple stories, the second you look, you're like, oh gosh. Erica, that complicated. drone story is <laughs> amazing. It's, we, it's we're just, gonna have to continue that conversation. Yeah, that it's a whole thing. I'll have to tell so you all about it. For me. <laughs> That's great. Um, Mika, I don't want to move on if you have something. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think uh, with kind of all of this information you've shared and with as the world has sort of started to open up again, I'd be curious to hear your perspectives on what the first, when you walk into a new gallery or museum or exhibition, what is one of the first things you notice? And what is something um, you tell people to sort of look out for when they are experiencing something new? I guess I can go. <laughs> um, I tend to start reading the, you know, the late, the introductory panel at first, just because I want to situate myself in terms of the actual, you know, what the perspective of the exhibition is and the story, but I actually would tell people not to do that right away. I know I would tell people to look at the artwork and how that is either challenging or, um, you know, how that speaks to them. I mean, it's it's hard to, to explain artwork to people who aren't within the, you know, already kind of, uh, especially contemporary. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would try to look at the work first instead of like read everything and then have, have that kind of um, dictate, you know, your your understanding as a conduit for the meaning of the work. Thank you. Anyone have something else? I don't know if I have a good answer to that feel like, you know, it's, it's sort of like every exhibition 
it, it asks you to sort of take a different approach to it, that there are sometimes you go in and you can tell right away from the design that they've done something that they want you to notice certain objects and sort of looking for those cues. Um, I feel like I'm always looking for like wayfinding um, moments that, that they're like, you know, the curator has taken this time to write a story through objects and I, and I wanna understand that story to the best of my ability and, and looking for, for how they've done that. Um, I feel like I need to go into uh, exhibitions and not read the label sometimes. Like, you know, as someone who writes labels, I'm always going and, you know, like Mika says, like I generally start with that intro text to situate myself, but I feel like it's always a really good reminder as a curator that so many of our visitors come in and don't read a single word that I have slaved over for so many, you know, like however many hours of research and writing and, and taking in those moments to also just find an object and really be there with that and, and you know, pause a bit. That's, it's hard, but it's something that I feel like is also an important experience to, to look for in the gallery. It's a good question, Megan. I really like the question, um, and I and I and I like what Erica is saying um, of just like visitor object communion. And all I would uh, encourage, and I've already talked about it, is um, one good way to activate that in real time with somebody. I mean, you could just—it's a very powerful thing that happens only in museums and galleries with real art objects. So you're looking and you're talking and you're seeing things together. Or if you go by yourself, which a lot of people like to do, to actually like take take a pad and and write down what you're seeing, and things you see you you you're like I said you're activating your your engagement and you're actually evolving your understanding of that thing, um, and it's it's what it's all about really. Uh, so it's it's definitely worth worth uh, trying. Thank you. Connie, anything to add? Not, not really, except to underscore the importance of seeing it in the real. You know, I feel like particularly in the contemporary arena, but it's probably true too. In the 19th century, you know, the market has become so, especially during COVID, um, everyone's looking at everything on their phones and on their screens and buying a lot of art, by the way, based on that. And I just feel like I'm constantly saying to collectors, but also to non-art people, potential viewers, is that you have to experience it in person. It's absolutely a different thing. And it changes when you see it in person. And um, just the importance of that, you know, just as it's important for us to all get off Zoom and be with each other in the real and look each other in the eye, it's also important to, to see a work of art in person. Thank you. I, if I can share, that question was inspired by a gallery educator who once asked a tour group that I was part of to sketch a painting we were looking at. And I am not an artist by any stretch of the imagination. My sketch turned out to be scribbles and stick figures. But what I noticed when we all showed each other what we'd sketched was that we had all picked out a different part of the painting that to, to sketch and it was a you know he gave us about a minute to do it so it's very quick and it I suddenly saw different parts of the painting in a way that I had not seen when we first walked up to it and so I think everything you're saying goes into that and especially um, being there in person with other people was a huge part of that experience and seeing seeing a different part of the object um well with a few minutes left I'm wondering if I can ask a, a big question, which is, do you have a favorite object or artist that you either have, have worked with in your own discipline or come across in your career? And maybe that will be like choosing a favorite child, but I'm, I'm going to pose it nonetheless. I have a really weird answer that I'm just gonna go with, that's a type of object. Um, so my, my work is mostly in, in Cameroon. Um, and in the region that I work in, in Cameroon, they historically um, would drink out of these dwarf buffalo horn drinking horns that as a family sort of like 
went through it went through generations that you would receive this kind of horn from the king and then a family you would like carve it and embellish it to show how each generation sort of gained more prestige in the community and these objects like time and again are just like totally my favorite and it's so weird that my answer is buffalo drinking horns from Cameroon but I'm going with it there are some that are just like like incredibly three-dimensional where they've actually managed to carve away the horn so that it is almost entirely detached from the main structure of of the cup um so so yeah so I definitely um put those into exhibitions whenever I get the opportunity just because I love pulling them out of storage and showing them to people and then talking about them in the gallery so it's you know that's all self-serving right there I don't I it's a cliche thing to say but I don't have a favorite I have many favorites and uh part of that is because I'm fascinated by how one's favorites change over time that there are things that I am totally obsessed with now that I used to think weren't interesting at all and that that's fascinating to me like what makes that change and what makes our eye shift and our interest shift and um I yeah I don't I made a pilgrimage recently to see a painting by the um 17th century Spanish still life painter um Julio Cotan I think is his name I can't remember it right now but um it's in the San Diego Cotan. that's the guy he's my yeah. favorite oh god Connie he is the oh there's one in the San Diego Museum of Art, which I didn't know has a really interesting 18th and 19th century painting collection. And uh, I got there to learn that the artist Colleen Smith was also obsessed with that painting and made a small show around that painting. So it was kind of isolated in a gallery. Um, and it was just, it rewarded everything I had hoped for in person too. It was amazing. What, what is the artist's name again, Colleen? Colleen Smith, she's a video artist who teaches oh, cool. at CalArts. Oh, and cool. uh, she, she was attracted to the light in the painting and the backgrounds, which are always very, uh, a kind of deep velvety black often. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, that, I can see that in video. Absolutely. Yeah, and so she and made- fruit the hanging from strings and things like that, isn't that what yeah. it has? Oh, it's so yes, good. Yes, it is food hanging from strings. And yeah. it's, uh, there's a, uh, there's a whole book that Norman Bryson wrote about still life and it's in that. Yes. And I read it as a graduate student and I've reread it a million times since. And so I- And it's in San Diego. And it's in San Diego. <laughs> so great. There you go. Pilgrimages are really fun, right? Yeah. When you go, when you really like experience pain to see something or some Completely. show or it just yeah. enhances the thing. I was just gonna say, um, yeah, impossible to say who, your, who my favorite artist is. But one thing that happens is, is with acquisitions and the way that you you almost have to fall in love with the object in order to get the board to sign over whatever that thing might cost and you end up you know really being its its um uh lobbyist um and uh and it's it's so satisfying because you you do fall deeply in love with an object and if you were able to bring it into the collection it's the thing that when your poor friends come to visit that you drag them to see and you tell them the whole story because you've had to learn the whole story and that's really exciting but my current favorite object my uh object at the gallery that that is my favorite changes constantly because it's such an amazing collection my current favorite happens to be rembrandt's rape of lucretia which i think it is just mm. one of the most incredible things and so it's not even in my bailiwick i'm not even it's not even my responsibility but that painting slays me and I think that it was brought alive uh, hanging out with the curator who's responsible for it and she was presenting it to a group of donors and she just as she spoke it just clicked in so it's just there's always um, as Connie says always something new to discover which is why this is the funnest job that I can imagine and I, I just feel like maybe we would all agree on that it's um, it's super fun. I also don't have a specific favorite, but I guess I would just say that, I don't even know if we're allowed to talk about this, Connie, but the show that I'm working on for The Hammer, um, it's gonna be in 2024, and I'm co-curating uh, with an artist named Blancaino. It's the, probably the most challenging exhibition I've ever worked on in my life. It's about climate justice and 
um, you know, it's a show, it's not, so it's not objects, but actually the artists who I've been talking to, the, you know, type of um, objectives that we are trying to establish with the show. Um, I mean, it's a constant discovery and, and um, it just blows my mind every time I'm, I'm in, a, in a conversation with, um, there's an artist named Amy Balkin who is an active Fist, but also is just has an incredible knowledge about atmos at the atmosphere and the pollution and the politics that are that is happening and the projects that she's coming up with. Um, it's you know it's they're not so the thing is like I'm wor very work uh, used to working with artists who make objects and um, you know have a history a very long uh, history but. In terms of this show, it's you know um, beyond the space of the work itself. It's about um, how to how to think of you know you can't have a resolution for climate change, but how to think of ways like Connie was saying you know acts of resistance um, in terms of how to think about uh, and have a kind of um, initiate initiate yourself with the types of questions to ask and. Um, in terms of how we uh, live and for our, our future generations, and um, you know, just reevaluate everything about um, you, how you eat, live, breathe, you know, you name it. So, I guess that's my favorite project I'm working on, and so <laughs> I'm excited um, to move forward with it. Great. Well, we are just past the top of the hour and I know there are quite a few questions we didn't get to in the chat. So I will try and maybe I'll send um, you all an email and if you would respond, I can send answers to some of these folks. So, um, but I, I really wanna thank everyone for, for joining us this morning. And I particularly wanna thank all four of you. This has been such a treat. I don't know about everyone else, but I am itching to get into a gallery now. I feel like I wanna sign off of this and run straight to a museum. And that is such a testament to the passion with which all of you speak and just the excitement about your work. This, is, this has really been such a treat. So. Thank you all and thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Megan. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Nice to see you all. <laughs>